All right, welcome everyone. This is Menstrual Health Through the Five Senses, and today we'll be talking about the sense of taste. Um, to get started here, this is the fourth out of the fifth installment of Menstrual Health Through the Five Senses. So in the past month, we've covered sight, touch, smell, and now we're going to talk about taste, and then next week we'll finish it up by talking about the sense of hearing. And for uh, those of you who don't know me, my name is Nicole. I'm a menstrual health educator who began charting my fertility in uh, 2015 and talking about it publicly just about a year later. Um, so I've been publicly talking about my cycle um, for uh, quite a few years. And I eventually started working with others on their menstrual health. And uh, I also run a small farm in Herbal Apothecary that focuses on um, general preventative health and also reproductive and sexual health. And so if you want to um, find some reference images to use for our class today, you can access the images by going to learnbodyliteracy.com slash visual reader or learnbodyliteracy.com slash anatomy. And on both of those pages, you can find um, basic uh, drawings to work with for our class today. Um, and this class is, comes out of my uh, book that I wrote two years ago called Fertility Awareness Through the Five Senses. And it was mainly about um, learning how to observe your fertility signs and the changes of the menstrual cycle uh, through your senses and breaking it all the way down to just how you physically interact with your body. And so I wanted to teach a class that used art to talk about um, this concept of, you know, the, the sensory connection between you and your body and, of course, using your menstrual cycle as a, a vital sign. And so that, that's really how this class came about. Um, so thanks for being here, and I'm happy to be sharing this with you. So today we're going to be talking about taste, right? And last week we talked about smell. And so your sense of smell and your sense of taste are actually interlocked because they're united in this same airway basically so you're using the same airway to smell and taste and therefore these uh, two senses are intimately linked together and so it's no surprise that your sense of smell and also your sense of taste are affected by the hormonal changes of the cycle because as we talked about last time it affects quite a bit uh, concerning smell and so sharper senses in general help us distinguish what we find interesting, what we find attractive, what we might find potentially dangerous. Um, so our brain is like working on this, you know, this more subconscious level in terms of how these endocrine um, signals are, are changing throughout the menstrual cycle. And so high levels of estrogen in the follicular phase heighten our sense of taste. And it helps us distinguish between sexual partners, maybe in an effort to promote reproduction or promote sex in general, um, and particularly with partners who may be genetically diverse from us. So smell and taste are um, two things that, that you need to get up close to a person to experience them. Um, but when you do, they tell you vital information about the other person and even their potentially their genetics. Um, which is very interesting because if this stuff is changing in the fertile window, it obviously must have, um, you know, some connection to the, the reproduction specifically. Um, and so estrogen seems to make rewarding things feel even more rewarding than they do in its absence. And progesterone, on the other hand, attenuates these effects. So perhaps, you know, this, how this affects taste um, should be considered more. And we, of course, have the taste of vaginal secretions. Last time we talked about the smell, the different smell changes with cervical fluid, right? And so the taste of your vaginal fluids is also going to change along with the smell. And that's as a result of those normal fluctuations in the menstrual cycle, which change the profile of healthy bacteria, as well as the type of cervical fluid that's actually going to be produced. And so during your infertile phases, the vagina may taste more acidic or sour. And then as you approach ovulation, the vagina and I guess the vulva in, in the sense of what you'd really be tasting most of um, may taste neutral or sweeter. And this is due to the change in the vaginal environment during the fertile window. 
So we talked about that last time. We looked at the wheel and how the menstrual wheel changes. Um, and basically the pH is changing along with the vaginal flora. So the, the flora is changing and what it's spitting out on the other end is changing the pH environment. And so I also want to be very clear here that um, even though as we approach ovulation, there may be more of like a neutral to sweeter smell instead of the more acidic uh, smell that dominates in the other phases of the cycle. But the vagina is never supposed to taste like flowers or fruit or, you know, products that are marketed to us that make these claims about how to um, make our uh, vulvas and vaginas smell more palatable to others. Um, but the fact of the matter is that it's it is a palatable smell and it should be palatable to the person that you are engaging with. Um, so these um, things, obviously, they, they promote stigma. And so that's one reason why I wanted to talk about taste um, is to kind of talk about the stigma of taste as well. Um, so other factors can impact your vagina's taste, of course, um, diet, uh, alcohol intake, tobacco usage, um, possible infections, of course, like STIs, um, bacterial infections like bacterial vaginosis or uh, yeast infection, all of these things um, would, of course, disrupt or change the microbiota and that the impact of that is that it will change the taste. Um, and so the taste of your vaginal fluids is likely to fluctuate during the menstrual cycle. It's no, nothing really in the menstrual cycle stays static. It's always dynamic and always changing. However, these are all in the realm of normal. Um, you know, of course, barring that, that there is other symptoms present. Um, so anywhere from, from acidic to neutral is, you know, totally considered typical. And so last time we also talked about the smell changes as they occur, um, you know, through the changing cervix. And so this is that same image again. The cervix is changing. The, the crypts are opening. Different crypts are opening to release different types of fluid. And that's where the effect on smell and taste is coming from. And also in this graphic, same thing. We, we basically last time talked about how smell changes based, you know, on looking at the pH through the lens of my fertility awareness chart example. And so like, you know, as the cycle is going forward, we're seeing these slight fluctuations going from acidic to neutral and going back to acidic again. So typically this is where you would see those taste changes at those points of change between um, those different pHs and of course the, the changing fluids with them. So cycling your appetite and cravings. This is the other major part of taste that I wanted to chat with you about before we get to the art making portion of today's class. So how you are inspired to cook and how you're inspired to eat is impacted by the changes in your menstrual cycle. So our cycle is so significant that it changes how we eat, what nutrients we need when and how much we need to eat. So we don't need to create more restrictions like from this knowledge basically of how our appetite is you know, changing and how it follows the infradian rhythm. But we can use this information to enjoy each phase and actually flow with our cycle in terms of our nutrition and the joy and deliciousness of, of eating. And so this takes some practice because we're so used to diet culture, restriction, and a lot of really other you know, negatively associated issues that that come with uh, with talking about food. And of course, this is to our detriment because um, food has so much culture and joy contained within it. Um, so rotating your diet loosely based on your menstrual cycle and maybe your ancestral foods are involved as well. Maybe you do a dive into your heritage and how that connects with your, your menstrual foods. And really listening to your taste buds and, and trying to become more um, in tune with what your body is asking you, as well as becoming more body literate, which gives you a framework for understanding what your body might be asking you. Um, that also really helps, you know, your general quality of life and experience of menstruation, um, especially in terms of reducing pain, which is a big topic that I work on with people. Um, and diet and sort of the ritualizing that happens in the premenstrual phase is important to that. So now we're going to take a look at the, the quadrants of the menstrual cycle quick, and we'll talk about like the foods that maybe can be helpful for each. So 
We'll start with the menstrual phase. So, you know, each menstrual cycle begins with the menstrual bleed, which is day one. And so during your bleed, you may need micronutrients and particularly minerals, minerals that build the blood. And the reason for this is because it counteracts the loss of blood that you experience during menstru menstruation, basically. So the general notes for this are to eat more warm foods, to drink more warm drinks, and to increase your intake of protein and fats while you're menstruating. So really nutrient dense and rich foods. Um, and you know, you also, I wanted to talk about this as well. You want to make less complicated meals during menstruation. <laughs> save leftovers you know make a bigger pan pan or pot of something and save it for maybe the day after or the next day so that you you aren't you know expending so much energy making three meals a day for yourself trying to do good nutrition and take care of your body and work and take care of kids and do all of these things all you know there's so much on our plate basically so i think that when it comes to the menstrual phase it's also about simplicity in terms of planning meals and really trying to conserve energy and respect the fact that your body might want to rest while menstruating more than your typical baseline energy levels. And for the, the folks on live who just asked, yes, this will be posted. It will be posted on my Learn Body Literacy YouTube channel. Um, this is a community engagement project. And part of it is that afterwards, this stuff will be uploaded into a public archive um, so that we can look back on um, the art that we made through this session together. So this and all the other episodes will be uploaded onto YouTube after. Um, so that's the menstrual phase. And here I've shown some foods that I enjoy eating in the menstrual phase, things like stew and soup, also fish eggs, red meats, um, leafy green vegetables that I have to cook like collard greens, kale, things that have a, a deeper um, and maybe a little bit tougher of a texture. Um, deeper flavor profile as well. So, um, and dairy as well. I also, I, I enjoy some goat milk, so I put that on there too. Um, and then we'll move on to the follicular and a little bit of the ovulatory phase because essentially the follicular is moving into ovulation. And so after your menstruation is finished, you may transition to maybe wanting to eat some lighter, fresher meals. And that may include foods that are fermented, fresh vegetables and fruits, lean proteins, and other sources of fiber. And so in the first half of your menstrual cycle, your metabolism is a little bit slower, which means that you need less food energy intake to do the same work um, as compared to the second half of the cycle. And so you may just trend towards eating a little bit less, like in terms of maybe your meals are just a little bit lighter because you feel full faster. Um, or maybe you just don't feel like you need to eat as often as you might in the luteal phase. So this is something that you're only going to figure out by, you know, working with your body and paying attention to what it's asking you. And so some foods that I tend to eat in the follicular ovulatory phase are like lots of fresh fruits and vegetables, um, pate, fish, you know, grilled fish, things like that, salads and things I would be having in the middle of my cycle and such. And then after ovulation is the luteal phase. So after ovulation, progesterone rises in the second half of the cycle, and this stimulates our metabolism. And that actually means that we burn more fuel to do the same work. So we actually need more fuel. Um, and so you're gonna naturally be hungrier in the second half of your menstrual cycle and as you approach your next um, bleed. And so this is totally normal. Um, and you may wanna eat foods with more B vitamins and minerals like magnesium, zinc, and selenium, and also enjoy lots of slow burning carbs, animal proteins, and fats, basically as much nutrient dense food as you would like. And so I put some images here that I also like. Clam pasta is really nice turkey, um, right, rice dishes, uh, beets, um, sweet potatoes, uh, coconut oil is shown here as a, a good healthy fat. Of course, liver, um, kimchi, uh, th you know, pretty much just keeping it simple and enjoying what I like to eat in the, in the luteal phase. And then there is herbal teas. So not exactly a food, but also herbal teas can be a great thing to cycle on and off of when you are going into different phases of your cycle, depending on kind of what your body's asking for. And so these are just a few choices um, that I've worked with in the past that I enjoy, things like raspberry, stinging nettle, 
milk thistle, spearmint, ginger, um, and various types of uh, teas, like a black tea or green tea, guerra tea. So how do we use taste to observe the menstrual cycle? Basically, the recap is that we use taste because we sometimes taste our cervical and vaginal fluids. I know people who taste their own and I know people whose partners taste them. Um, taste affecting intuitive eating. So obviously like what you're craving and what your body is intuitively asking for is gonna change. Um, taste as a secondary fertility sign. So again, maybe a situation where um, you yourself notice the changes and are able to identify them as being associated with your fertile window. So you'll know going into future fertile windows, you know, to expect these types of taste and smell changes. And of course, cycling eating patterns, that's what we just talked about. So you can um, utilize taste to cycle your eating patterns. So how can we explore our sense of taste to deepen body literacy? That is the question. So that's what we'll be working on today. So now we're going to go into the community engagement portion of the session, which uh, participation is, of course, optional but encouraged. So you're welcome to share your art making. Um, and I appreciate any documentation of your art making. Um, and so if you would like to send me things, you can send them to fantaughtme at gmail.com or you can send a message to Learn Body Literacy and I'll, I'll catch you there and we can connect and I would love to see some of your work. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate you saying that. Someone in chat just said the amount of wisdom you hold and share. I very much appreciate that. Um, thank you so much for coming and participating. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to warm up here for those of us that want to participate. Um, we're just going to start with some uh, basic sketches. And the purpose of these is to just start thinking about how we want to utilize taste. So the first thing that we're going to do is take a basic uh, piece of paper and pencil. Um, and we're just going to do a single line study that lasts for one minute. That just means you're going to kind of draw and ponder what you're going to do for your taste study. And you're just going to not pick your pencil up off the paper. So you're just kind of going to do one line drawing um, and see how that goes. I'll show you from past weeks a couple of the things that I've worked on that were like... These are warm-up studies, so very basic. This was like a clitoris study here. And then this one was um, talking about the pH wheel. So go ahead and take one minute to start to think about what you might want to use for your taste study. And you can always refer to any of the resources in the Body Literacy Visual Reader or coloring book um, as they have a lot of drawings that you can download um, and draw from them. Um, this is last week, it finally dried. If anyone wants to see what we did last week. Okay, so keep working on those. I'm gonna do what, my one minute, just give me a moment here. All right, so, hmm. Oh, here's my first one too. This one was of the cervical crypts that I worked on from a previous session. So very low stakes. We're just warming up and thinking about um, 
how to translate things visually. Okay, so here's my first minute long drawing. Today, my plan is to actually make a 3D sculpture out of some fruits that I have here. Here's my fruits. So my goal is to, you know, again, similar to last time when I played with flowers, I'm kind of pushing back on the idea of um, the way that our vaginas are like, and vulvas are marketed to us as having like, uh, having to have a flavor or um, something recognizable. And of course, with both flowers and fruits, there's the fertility connection. So, you know, they're somewhat, um, they're somewhat related in the sense that uh, they have these motifs of fertility that are involved with them. And that may be why they're associated with femininity and therefore the menstrual cycle. So I suspect it has something to do with that and reinforcing that. Um, but it also reinforces the stigma of concealing your natural smell and taste in order to um, become more palatable to someone else, I'm, I'm assuming is the, um, the kind of the message with that. So now we're going to do a second warm up, which is to basically take our single line drawing and develop it a little bit more. So anything that you'd like to work on in regards to taste, and you could switch your project too if you'd like. Um, we're just going to take two minutes to continue warming up and uh, and developing our thoughts on this project. So I'm just going to take some moments to do that before I switch to the full study. Um, can I ask a quick question? Absolutely. So I was kind of thinking about um, the tongue and how the tongue has different areas where there are flavors uh, where we sense flavors and i was thinking about how that might move around during the menstrual cycle and you were talking about cravings and so i'm wondering if you can talk about or if you know if there are different parts of the cycle where you have more salty cravings or sweet cravings i think you mentioned it but i did not memorize it immediately in that slide or you know yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, somewhat. So the basically the body sort of um, it switches its uh, sort of dominance in terms of whether you're in more of a, a salt retention or a salt release phase um, with estrogen and progesterone. And so my understanding is that. Um, you know, you may have more cravings for either sweet or salty in the luteal phase. However, I've noticed that some people do have maybe moderated effects from the fertile window and changes um, that result from it. But I wonder if there's any research on the different parts of the tongue specifically and whether like they're they're sort of like maybe more activated or excited by the presence of the different hormones. Cause usually what's happening is a certain part of the body, whether it's the mouth or the, the nose, um, the estrogen comes in to that area and attaches to the cells there. And it has, you know, these very specific receptors for them. So even though it's your eardrum, like estrogen is still going into your ear and it may change the way that you listen to something. Um, so that's how powerful that estrogen is. It's able to go in and basically change these cells processes when it's present. And so I assume that both times, uh, basically the change that occur the major change that occurs during ovulation, and then also the dip of hormones that occurs in essentially leading up to menstruation, um, that they both have the potential to cause certain cravings, um, but I would love to to see if there's any any more research on that. That's a great question. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. Yeah, of course. Um, and I believe like it's progesterone that helps you retain sodium and estrogen flushes it. So I think it's why people also notice more like puffiness or like 
bloatedness in the luteal phase as well um, because it's related to sodium retention. Um, so I think I've got an idea here for my for my drawing or my sculpture, I guess I could say. And if everyone's ready, we're going to move on to the full taste study. So now we're going to take um, about 20 minutes or so to take our drawing here, our plan, and bring it to life. So um, similarly to last time where I worked with flowers, this time my plan is to work with fruit to, again, sort of play with this idea of... Um, you know, masking your scent or masking your taste. And uh, even other beauty products or personal care products also, you know, it is about changing our scent. Um, and I'm just curious, like, how everyone feels about about that. Is it something that's positive for you? Is it something that's neutral for you? Or is it something that you have a negative association with? Um, I'm always curious just how, how people react to... Um, these ideas because we may not all feel the same. Actually, I know we don't all feel the same about things. So um, I love to hear, you know, just from folks about their um, take on it and whether they feel it is um, a good thing or a bad thing or otherwise. Um, but yeah, now basically I'm just gonna jam out and see if I can make a small sculpture here. Um, and I encourage you all, whether you're doing 2D or 3D art, to work on this taste study with us. So um, find a theme related to taste and your menstrual cycle. And you can refer to any of the images on, on the website if you need help with like the anatomical parts of the drawing. And you can go to learnbodyliteracy.com slash anatomy to check those out. And uh, and I'll be back in just a few minutes to um, update you on what my, my sculpture looks like and whether it's successful also, because you know this is all an experiment. <laughs> And so I kind of, I guess my, my goal with this was to just look at different fruits that reminded me of these, these different areas. So I kind of started with grapes at the top to represent the follicles in the, the ovary. So that's what you see up at the top there. And then I used some green onions for the uterine tubes. So you can see the the uterine tubes there connect to the avocado, which is the uterus. It actually is a pretty good, I would say a pretty good rendering for a uterus. It's this very similar shape, that sort of pear shape that's wider at the top than the bottom. And then I use a cherry tomato for the cervix. I couldn't really figure out what a good cervix would be, but I think it was the smallest fruit I had to work with. And then for the vaginal canal, I used a pickling pepper um, to show the canal. And then these two green almonds are what you see at the bottom here. Those are the vestibular glands. So um, they secrete sexual arousal fluid 
They're at the bottom of the vaginal canal, right before the openings of the uh, the vaginal opening and the um, labia. And so for the labia, the you know folds of the labia, I use some bay leaves to suggest that. So this is just my my take on a fruit study of the menstrual uh, apparatus. And so, um, Natalie, did you work on a study uh, today? I did. It's not <laughs> as well uh, thought out or anything as last time. Um, what I was trying to do, uh, oh, let me take this off. I was trying to show like the um, menstrual lining kind of in like a, a wave okay. here with like appetite or needs like being like the sine cosine wave to it. I couldn't okay. really come up with anything <laughs> else, but I had fun kind of like drawing it. There's a bunch of like really bad renderings. I was trying to figure out if I could make it circular and it was just like coming out as like oblong shapes. <laughs> so I love that. It was it cool. exactly yeah. as I want. Yeah. And yeah. so do you think that your your relationship with taste will continue to develop or do you feel like you fully understand the capacity of your sort of your relationship with taste and, and how it changes? Um, I'm really excited to eat more in line with my uh, cycle. It's one of the things that's kind of been in the back of my head that I wanted to make some more uh, conscious decisions about it. And I think, um, it's been really helpful to learn how my appetite changes with my cycle. I think I feel like it uh, it really lets me uh, kind of get rid of that restrictive mindset, especially when I'm menstruating. Um, and I think it helps me kind of understand my body a little more instead of fighting it, um, that I can go along with it. Um, I do drink a ton of tea, so I'm also really excited to um, kind of go through the um, teas that you mentioned. I have some of them in my in my cabinet. So, uh, yeah, I think um, that uh, the relationship of food and taste to my cycle is something that I still want to like grow and, and and get to understand better and on a more individual level for myself. So, 